Noses and their ability to detect smell may not be as celebrated in words and songs as our other human senses, but today's guest says sense tells stories too. She's Saskia Wilson-Brown this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Selvey Virginia University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller with the Providence Journal. This week we're joined by Saskia Wilson-Brown, founder of the Institute for Art and Olfaction. She joins us today from Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Saskia. Thank you. Nice to be here. So uh, the Institute for Art and Olfaction. So for those, of us, for those in our audience who maybe don't know what it is, tell us about it. Well, um, it's a nonprofit devoted to experimentation and access in the field of perfumery based in Los Angeles. Um, I founded it just about 10 years ago now, actually. So we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. And we do a lot of uh, events relating to smell. We help people incorporate smell into their own practices, artists, musicians. You know, um, and then we do a lot of education as well. And that's the short version. <laughs> what, what was the inspiration for it? Well, I was working in television at the time and I was interested in sort of how TV was being, you know, quote, democratized by, uh, by or, you know, people were saying it was being democratized by YouTube or I guess media was being democratized. And I became interested in the perfume industry because the industry, as far as I could tell, hadn't gone through those processes of opening up yet. So I was sort of inspired to re-examine that a little, or examine that, I guess, a little bit and create a space for that, you know, opening up uh, so other people could learn about uh, perfume, much like people have learned how to make media, you know, with YouTube and uh, DSLRs and so on. So when you break it all down, smells and scents tell stories and they have historically, and we're going to get into the history, which I found fascinating when I was talking to you before the show, but talk about the kinds of stories they tell and, and why, they, why they tell stories. Well, I think the thing that appeals to storytellers about smell is that when you're talking about, for instance, the traditional perfume structure, you're talking about a structure that has a three act structure. You know, there's a top, a middle and a base. And I think there's something very human about this idea of like introduction, you know, action, conclusion that lends itself to story. Uh, you know, also smells themselves, you know, obviously convey information much like words do or images do. And so you can use them to, to, to narrate something for lack of a better example. Um, yeah, so in that sense, I think smell really lends itself to story and then story also lends itself to smell. You know, um, yeah. So th these stories began a long time ago. Give us the historical perspective on <laughs> on perfume and scent, and, and we yeah. probably I mean, could do a whole. There's such a deep history. How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, it would take as much time as you want because again, this is all this is new to to me certainly and and fascinating. Yeah. Well, to summarize, I mean, the history of smell is the history of humanity. You know, I mean, as long as we've been engaging in, you know, um, worship, you know, seduction, beauty, all the uh, commerce, you know, all that stuff relates to smell. So, you know, the early instances archeologically of smell, you know, come to us from, from ancient Egypt and then later, uh, you know, Mesopotamia, what is now Iraq. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's instances of archeology span of, of smell production, perfume production actually from Greece, um, all the way through the Romans up to today. And then, you know, in, in ancient China, there's records of smell. In eighth century Japan, we have a record of incense practices. You know, there's all sorts of archeological and written evidence of people working with and using smell. And typically it falls in, in sort of five areas of, of, of uh, activity. So there's, we talked about religious, religious practices, scents being used in, in scents or in churches or in worship in general. Um, seduction, you know, there's a huge relationship between smell and seduction through, through time. Uh, beauty and wellness, commerce, and then also power, 
you know, scent has been used to convey power from ancient times to today. So yeah, it's a broad history. <laughs> it's the history of humanity really, uh, which I find fascinating. So let's break some of those down. Talk about the relationship between perfume and scent and power. And maybe you can give us some uh, historical examples, names of, of rulers or, or kings or whatever. Sure, yeah. So this is a topic I'm studying a lot right now. So, I mean, if you wanted to summarize it, I think the relationship between scent and power would be that scent has been used to convey power. So specific examples are, you know, Emperor Constantine uh, in what, 300 AD, more or less, um, in what's now Istanbul, would use scent to, they would, they would, they would disseminate, you know, smell aromatics along the routes he was walking in order to convey this sort of aromatic, you know, um, superiority, I guess, that was then equated with his manifestation of power. You know, you know, historically, people have always spoken about Cleopatra in the context of smell and power. And largely, this comes to us from sort of Roman perspectives, which, which tended to be a little bit um, sniffy, you know, for lack of a better <laughs> word. But so there, there's this idea that Cleopatra would have used scent in order to one seduce, you know, the, the hapless Roman generals, but also to convey her power. You know, more recently, you have um, Louis XIV, who was so entranced with the idea of manifesting the glory and the power of France through his physical person. And that came out through his clothing, all the pomp and circumstance he set up at his um, newly uh, built palace in Versailles, and then also smell. You know, he, he had a real interest in smell, almost one might say an obsession, so much so that by the end of his life, um, Saint-Simon, who was a sort of a contemporary chronicler said that he became allergic to smell. So that tells you how much he was using smell. Huh. And, and you know, from what I've researched, what I've sort of concluded is that a lot of that was in the context of disseminating glory. You know, he didn't just look kingly, he smelled kingly. And then you also see the relationship in religion. You know, God, in most religions, God has a pleasant aroma. And, you know, God is all powerful. And therefore, these pleasant aromas are associated with that sense of power. So that's like a summary <laughs> of a big topic, but um, I hope that explains it a little. Saskia, you, you, you talk about kings and royal courts where, where scent was very important. When did scent, and I guess good scent, a sweet scent, a desirable scent, become more democratic? I mean, it's interesting because when you start to research this stuff, you see these sort of movements towards democratizing scent, you know, through time. For instance, in the 19th century, there was there was a lot of people publishing about perfume. Um, but really, I would say like our current sort of democratization, always in quotes, uh, comes to us from the, the rise of the Internet, you know, like many things. Um, yeah, people started talking more about the ingredients, the materials of smell. They started sharing more information about how smells were made. And then in the 70s, there was a new technology, the GCMS, the, I can never say it right, gas chromatic mass spectrometry, which can tell you what are the molecular, com molecular components of a smell. So what that allows people to do is effectively reverse engineer what's in a perfume. So that of course led to a lot of information sharing, you know. And then, and then middlemen came that would sm sell the materials at smaller amounts, you know? Uh, and we're talking now about contemporary materials. We're talking about both naturals and synthetics. Um, yeah, so in the last 20 or so years, it really, you saw a big difference in how scent was being shared. Can, can you walk us through the, the process today of creating and, and coming up with, with a scent or a new perfume, so creating it, manufacturing it, marketing it. I mean, it, it obviously is much different than 100 years ago or even 20 years ago. Yeah. What is that process well, actually, like? Yeah, it's actually sort of, I mean, the, the change really happened in the 1800s with the rise of the synthetics, you know? Um, so the first, you know, synthetic material was isolated from tonka bean and it was called coumarin. And it was named coumarin by a French chemist, although a German chemist had discovered it simultaneously. and. Long story short, what that allowed to happen is scent was being made um, at larger quantities and eventually the, the synthetics themselves became more important and the companies started subsuming one another. And so the whole 20th century is sort of a march towards where we are today, 
Uh, and so to, to answer your question, the way ascent gets made in the mainstream is, you know, there's fragrance houses, uh, IFF, Jevedon, Fermanich, Takasago, Man, they have different names. And they are working with uh, companies like L'Oreal or LVMH to create smells for, you know, new launches. So it's entirely, mainstream perfumery is, is entirely corporate, you know. The, let's say, let's use an example, like fashion company A decides they're going to launch a perfume in 2023, you know, and it's going to be a perfume about power. <laughs> they write a creative brief. Um, they run it through whoever owns the company or the company itself would control it. But let's say they run it through the execs at L'Oreal or uh, LVMH or um, Coty or something. And then they go to the fragrance houses with whom they have a relationship. They say, this is what we want to do. What have you got? There's a back and forth process. At some point, you know, it gets approved and it goes into production. So it, it's a very um, far cry from how perfume would have been made 200 years ago when it was mostly individual perfumers with workshops, you know, in, in, in Paris, for instance, or even 2000 years ago in ancient Greece when it was again, small companies and workshops so using what was available. Is this, are these research scientists that are toiling away in a laboratory? Somebody says, I think, you know, the example you used was power. Uh, yeah. Does someone go back and say, okay, well, what does power smell like? I mean, how? How, how do you, how do you uh, tie those emotions to scents? Yeah, I mean, this is where the art of perfumery kicks in, I think. So, I mean, there's some, you know, common agreement. For instance, we might all agree that um, for whatever reason, maybe we think that vanilla doesn't smell powerful because we associate it with, let's say, young women, you know, that just I'm just using, using examples, you know. So I, I think that there's some sort of cultural knowledge that we share, generally speaking, although that does share, uh, change a lot, you know, between countries and regions. But so, you know, the, the perfumers who are really the core artists of this whole affair, you know, have to have that task of saying, okay, well, how do I interpret power? How does the client, you know, interpret power? And how do I lend that to smell? And it's really hard, you know, it's really it's really subjective, I think. So yeah. it's really a process of agreement, like any client work, you know, it's, it's, you go back and forth. <laughs> you said something there that I found really fascinating, that there's some cultural cues here. I've heard comedians describe that their jokes that might work in one country won't work yeah. in another because you lack that cultural reference point. The same is true with scent? For sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, an example I like to give is in the U.S., you know, when we think of, um, when we smell clove, you know, the smell of cloves, yeah. we're generally more prone to think about that in the context of some sort of family celebration, like Thanksgiving or, you know, something like that, or Christmas, you know, it's got that at home, cozy family uh, association, generally speaking, you know. Whereas if you were raised, for instance, in France, where it was more common to use clove products in dental work, uh, the clove smell might associate one with the dentist. So it's an entirely different set of associations. And, and that, that has been, I mean, that is true. You know, I think a lot of materials have different associations culturally, you know, so, yeah. So uh, is there a finite number of scents or is there an infinite number of, of scents? I mean, perfume now has centuries and centuries and centuries of history. Yeah. But new ones are, are still emerging. Do we reach a point where that's it? We've come up with every scent possible? <laughs> You've got well, them all behind you now. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, know. I mean, that's the question for any artist, I think. I mean, have we reached the apex of painting? You know, I think, yeah. I mean, the thing that's different about perfumery is that there's new uh, aromatic molecules being developed all the time. You know, so every couple of years, you know, or every year or so, the fragrance houses put out... Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to quote a number, but, uh, you know, let's say around six or five new molecules that they developed in house. So they're literally inventing new smells. So for that reason, I think it's sort of limitless, but, you know, you do hit a peak, you know, flower perfume. I mean, how many more flower perfumes do we need? You know, that's, yeah. But, it, you know, it's all about human ingenuity. I mean, the, the, the limits of perfumery or working with smells are the limits of human ingenuity and capacity to, to get comfortable with strange combinations. Can you give uh, us a sense of dollar wise of the size of the perfume industry, both in the US and globally? Well, top of mind, I, I don't have more recent numbers, but I researched a little, some numbers from 
the most recent ones I could find and in 2016 for context. The, uh, the big six, you know, so the fragrance houses, um, IFF, Firmenich, Takasago, Man, uh, Givaudan, and Simrise. These are big six uh, corporations that basically make the fragrances. Their combined, you know, value or output, I guess, or income, I suppose, was uh, $15.93 billion. Whoa. Wow. And that's just one component of the industry. And that was 2016. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a big industry. <laughs> So, so you know, intellectual property has to be a piece of this if there's if there's that much money at play. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you can't patent a smell, but you can patent a compound. Is that is that yeah, is that reasonable? It's complicated. So you can't copyright a smell formula. So so you know, if I write a formula and it you know a, a recipe, as it were, and it goes to to market and it's a mega hit, I can't protect that from being copied. And that's why you see all these sort of copycat perfumes, like, what were they called? Um, oh, I can't remember what they were called, but you know, the perfumes that if you love Chanel number no. five, you'll love Chanel number no. 10. It's not <laughs> almost precisely the same. What you can protect in perfumery is you can patent the process by which you come to a new smell. So that process of developing the chemistry, uh, it can be protected. And these patented uh, aromatic molecules are known as captive molecules, and they're captive by the fragrance house that, that developed them. So I, that patent runs out. Sorry. I, I just so I just want to be clear. So a pharmaceutical company develops a new compound. They can patent and own the copyright on that compound for I think it's 18 years. A fragrance so company can't do the same thing with a new uh, with a new uh, formulation. The, not the formulation, but the process by which they come to the compound, the okay. aromatic that they use in the formulation okay. is what they can protect. It's not 18 years in perfumery. I think it's seven or eight. You okay. know, give or, I'm not a legal scholar, so <laughs> definitely check those facts, you know, but, but it's around there. So the, the, the point is that because there's not very clear uh, copyright protection on the actual formulations, you know, the, the recipe, as it were, um, it's a very uh, easy thing to copy. So there's a lot of copycat perfumes. So talk to us about the consumer side of, of this business. What are the factors that go into a, a person deciding to get a specific perfume? I mean, obviously advertising is a big piece of it, but then you have to, at some point, uh, smell it. I mean, you go into a Macy's or you go into a, a CVS or some other retail outlet, uh, and in most of those places you're allowed to at least smell. What goes into that? that whole decision-making process? What drives a person to buy? If I had the answer, I'd be a multimillionaire. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of factors at play. I mean, of course, there's very sophisticated marketing strategies, you know, based on consumer research and all that. Um, but, you know, to me, I think the core of why people smell or pick certain smells or perfumes, if you want to talk about perfume, is a question of how they want to perceive themselves, you know? I want to be perceived as, as an example, you know, a, a powerful man who's going to go make a million bucks today. You know, I'm going to pick a certain set of parameters in my decision than others. It generally has very little to do with the smell itself. Unfortunately, you know, the perfume is sort of the afterthought often in these decisions, I think. I mean, unless you really don't like it. But the marketing, the packaging, the, the imagery, that's what brings people there, you know, so... And, and I think that's actually the power of perfume is, is it's all about perception and communication and what you want to communicate in this very intangible way, uh, which is, it can be quite, you know, meaningful for people, you know. Do, do, you, do you find that consumers purchase, find, and like a particular perfume and stay with that over time? And I'll give you an analogy. If you drive Toyotas, you may always want to buy a Toyota. Do people switch around or, or do they cling to a particular perfume for a long period of time? Do you have any sense of that? I, I do sort of. I mean, I do. I think I think people get very attached to things in general. It's like a human thing, you know, um, and also perfumes related to memory. So you start to associate your own lived experience with a certain smell or, your, you know, your mother or your first partner or whatever, you know. But um, there's this idea in there's this idea in sort of mainstream perfumery, which I should say is really not my area of expertise. Like I just know from what I've I've learned just doing my own work. But 
that that um, there's the the fragrance wardrobe, you know, and this idea that you can select a fragrance to reflect whatever activity you're having that day. So, you know, a night on the town with your best friend is different from a, a black tie gala or a day at work is different from hanging at the beach and the smells can reflect those different situations. But most people that I come across have, you know, a sort of identifying smell that they're very attached to. And that's something that um, I don't know how to explain, except that it has to do again with self-perception, I think. Do you, so let's come back for a second to the Institute for Art and Olfaction. Uh, so you have a, a wide uh, array of programs that you actually operate. But one of the things that fascinated me was helping artists incorporate scent into their work. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, my back, 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 background is I'm an art or I was an artist, you know? Um, so I, what I, what, one of the reasons I became interested in scent, in addition to sort of the, the questions of access and power was the potential for communication in the context of art. So a lot of what we do is we, we artists come to us and they say, hey, I have an exhibition at this and that museum, and I want to convey the smell of Capri in the fall, whatever it is, you know? And so we'll, we'll help them figure out how to do that. One, what that actually smells like, what molecules, what aromatics to pick. And then also there's a lot of technicalities about how you convey smell in public spaces in particular, because people have discomforts or they have sensitivities. So um, we, we give a lot of advice and help on that in that regard. Uh, and we've had strange, I mean, we've had crazy projects, uh, crazy, I don't mean that pejoratively, but projects that, for instance, we had artists coming to us asking us for the smell of uh, fear Children, children screaming in fear, which I, you know, what your does guess that is smell as like? good as mine as to have it. <laughs> <that. Okay. laughs> so yeah, it's a tricky one. So another mission of the Institute is experimentation. Break that down for us. What kinds of experiments? I'm looking at all these things in, in the background here and thinking those are probably some of the uh, ingredients of, of many experiments. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it can be anything from an olfactory experimentation, like let's try this new combination that isn't very popular, you know, um, or, or mainstream or sellable to, uh, but, but mostly the experimentation we engage in has to do with sort of the broader culture of, of perfumery as a whole. So um, an example is we worked with a gallery here in Los Angeles to create a series of motion sensitive scent robots that disseminated smell based on, you know, motion. Uh, so, so that's a sort of experimentation. It's sort of in the applications of smell, where, where you can use it, how you can disseminate it. And, and those, of course, were meant to be public, public art. So we were going to install them, you know, in the streets of LA and people would get like the smell as they walked by. But, you know, eventually we realized that probably wasn't so popular an idea. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what are the, know, things like that. One of the classes that you offered is called Meet a Nose. What is meet a nose? So nose or a ne in French is a traditional term that people have used to talk about perfumers. And it's a term that is associated with the Eurocentric perspective of perfumery. The perfumery comes to us from France, you know, uh, which is fallacious. It's not true, <laughs> you know, for obvious reasons. There's a history of perfumery throughout humanity. So, so the meet a nose program is, first we're subverting that a little bit by pointing out that everybody has a nose uh, and everybody's able or, you know, to a certain degree, able to engage with smell. And so what we do is we interview artists and perfumers and, you know, thinkers in the field of olfaction and we ask them about their practice. It's just a very simple interview show where I do the interview instead of being interviewed. <laughs> yeah. You also sponsor exhibits at the Institute. What, what are those about? And, and maybe you can tell us what, uh, what the next one is or the current one is. Sure, yeah. So we have a small gallery uh, at the Institute. Um, it's not huge, but it's big enough. So, so we, we, ho we host exhibitions of olfact or art that uses olfaction or the senses in general, but specifically smell. So recently we had a show um, from an artist called Sarana Mera, who's a British Indian artist who, who is now uh, living in Los Angeles, relating to how she experienced the pandemic, you know, um, and this sort of fear of, of smelling and fear of being close enough to smell somebody. Because if you're close enough to smell someone, you're probably 
you know, you're probably able to get their COVID if they not have it, you know, distancing. so there's a real anxiety about that, you know, and she explored that in the show. And then we have one coming up actually opening on Friday uh, by an artist called Joe Merrill, who also, you know, everyone's processing the pandemic is doing a show that relates to how he processed his own, you know, experience of grief and loss during the pandemic. Um, also through smell. Uh, smell relates a lot to our perceptions of our partners and our and our loved ones. So that's sort of what he's exploring in that a little bit, the loss of a loved one. You So uh, you also have a, a podcast, Perfume on the Radio. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the challenges that we've had here today was, you know, lack of smell of vision right? How do, how do you talk about <laughs> scent? Um, it's like describing a, the color blue, right? How, how, what kind of challenges? Or what, or what chicken tastes like. Exactly. How, how do you, Impossible. In, in the 30 seconds that we have left, how do you get guests to talk about scent uh, in an engaging manner? Uh, you, there's a lot of poetic speaking, you know? This feels like, you know, this one time I was in the wind and, you know. But also we talk a lot about culture. You know, the cultures around smell. So the smell itself becomes the conduit to a, a larger conversation around bigger topics like loss, death, cats, you know, you name it. Well, Saskia, this has been just a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. She's Saskia Wilson-Brown, the Institute for Art and Olfaction in Los Angeles, California. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>